back in Delhi. I used to do a lot of research in India, but I haven't for a while, so it's always nice to come back. Uh, so I'm going to talk today about learning from others, um, at just sort of about the challenge that we have uh, that this is trying to address. This framework I'm going to present is going to try and address and give some examples. So what I'm, I'm going to do is talk about how do we take evidence from one context and use it to learn about policy implementation uh, and policy design in another. Um, and so I'll talk about an, an example of immunization and then some general lessons, uh, give another, ex and another couple of examples and conclude. So the challenge that we're facing um, is that because of things like free IE and other big investments, we have seen a massive increase in the number of high quality impact evaluations around the around the world. But it's still the case that if you are a, a policymaker in a particular country uh, facing a particular question, it's very unlikely that there was a high, uh, you know, very rigorous impact evaluation of exactly that question in exactly your context. So, so the question is, what do you do in that, in that situation? Well, you could decide to wait until there was an impact evaluation in your context and kind of not do anything until then. You could say that you should always do a new rigorous impact evaluation in your context before you do anything. Um, or you could say, look, I'm, there isn't a, I don't have time, I've got to do something now, so I'm going to use local evidence even if it's not rigorous and maybe it's not an impact evaluation, but I'll just take something from the local context. Um, or should you use, try and use the results from another context and hope that it's relevant for you? Um, and a final alternative is you could say, well, I'll take evidence from another context, but only if there have been you know, four replications and they've all shown the same results. And only then do I think that, it, that I have some confidence that it'll, um, that it'll uh, work in my context. And I think what I'm gonna, um, gonna argue uh, is that none of those are the right response. <laughs> we need kind of a, a blend of all of those responses. Um, and, and I think it's, you know, one of the reasons why always do a new impact evaluation is not the right answer is that rigorous impact evaluations are expensive and they're hard to do. They're really hard to do well. So we can't, it's just an totally um, impossible goal to set ourselves that for every question a policymaker asks themselves, we will do a rigorous impact evaluation of it in that context. Like that's just too high a standard. Even if we had the money to do that, we wouldn't have the capacity in terms of enough skilled people to do that. So I think we always have to learn from others. We can't always do new rigorous impact evaluations. But it's also the case that local conditions and local needs and local institutions are incredibly important. Like we know that things are different in different countries and even within a country, uh, you know, we're talking about India, very different contexts in you know, rural, urban and different states. So we know that that local knowledge is incredibly important. So yes, we should be doing more replications to see if things also work in new contexts. But as they say, I don't think that is, we can always do that. So, um, and part of solving this problem is to just accept that we will never have a 100% guarantee that the decisions that we make are going to be the right decisions. Like that's too high a standard. But we can move forward and make better decisions. So I'm going to try and set out a framework for that is both pulling on the global evidence base and also recognises the importance of local knowledge and try and give you a framework for how you put together those different types of evidence to come up with better decision making. Um, yeah, so, so part of that is we we need to understand that when we're looking at evidence, we're never, we should never look at any one study in isolation. And I think a lot of the discussion around generalizability has made that mistake. It said, does this study replicate to another context? And when we're policymakers, and in a previous life, as you've heard, I was a policymaker, 
you never look at just one study. What you're trying to do is take all the evidence that's available and maybe weight some more than others, but you've got to see any study in the context of all the other information. Uh, you know, to be technical about this, we need to be Bayesian, uh, which means, you know, we, we take all the different information and put weights on, on kind of reliability. But we also have to recognize that we're asking different questions and different pieces of evidence and different kinds of evidence needs to answer those different questions. Um, so I'm going to try and, as they say, put, put together a structured way to combine theory, descriptive evidence, and evidence from impact evaluations uh, to come up with, to answer the questions of, you know, do we think that the results might replicate in a new country? And in doing this, I should say I'm drawing on a, on a, a, a quite a few of the examples draw from um, a work I did that sort of synthesized the results of 70 plus randomized trials on health in developing countries and drew out some general lessons from that. So let me talk concretely about what this would look like. So I was part of a team that did an evaluation of a program in India, which provided incentives to immunization. We worked with Save Mandir, who ran this program, to in increase immunization rates in Rajasthan uh, with, an, with an RCT. And the idea was to test two different aspects. One uh, was to what extent is the, was the very low immunization rate here due to problems of, of supply. Uh, we, you, you know, we did some, we first did descriptive work of like what were the needs in this area and we found that up to 40% of clinics were closed on any random visit because the, the nurses weren't there. So there was clearly a supply problem. Um, but we also then looked at the demand side and saw whether a small incentive could increase the demand for immunizations. And in this case, we gave a kilogram of doll for every vaccination. And something that people often forget, we gave um, a different incentive at the end of the program, which was a set of plates that sort of was um, influenced behavioral, by behavioral theory of sort of the salience of coming to the end of the immunization schedule. It was sort of very different thing. And you knew you hadn't got to the end until you got the plates. So this is the result. Um, and you can see the comparison group in yellow and then the light blue is immunization camp. So this is fixing supply. Absolutely, without fail, there will be a nurse on you know, the first Monday of the month um, in this given place, and she will provide vaccinations. Um, and then the third group, camps plus incentives, is you had the camps, you fix the supply, and then you add um, this incentive to come. And I think what I want you to notice here is, A, that 50% of kids, even without this, got some an immunization, but it goes down to 6% fully immunized, which I was more familiar with the context of sub-Saharan Africa when I worked here, and I was absolutely appalled that it could be anything like as low as 6%. Um, and then, you know, because most sub-Saharan African countries do better than that. Um, and then you see, Immunization camps fixing supply was very good at increasing the first vaccination, but it didn't actually do that much to increase full immunization. Um, the incentive didn't do anything at the beginning, but it really helped at the end. And what we learn from this is about what these different things are fixing. And they tell us something about the behavior. What are, what are the barriers? Um, if we think about this in a more theoretical context. So in particular, you know, the, the immunizations are helping people, the, the incentive is helping people persist, which fits very well with some behavioral theories of how, uh, of what, you know, what is the barrier to doing preventative health, which is you've got a cost now, benefit later, and people just kind of procrastinate and put it off. It's not that they have a deep objection to immunizations. So if they had a deep objection, they wouldn't be getting that first, that first shot. Um, so that was the theory we had going in, and it was, very much, um, it was very much supported by this evidence. So if I looked at this evidence in isolation, and I was working with a government in West Africa, which I am, 
which was facing a crisis of not having high, you know, having had a collapse in immunization rates because of Ebola, which I am. Um, what, to what extent could I say that they should be learning from this? Well, if I take this in isolation, I would say that was a study with an NGO in a different con continent, you know, completely different infrastructure. Why on earth would I, it's only one RCT, why would I think that this result would, would replicate? I want to try and persuade you that's not the right way to think about this at all. Right? Actually, I think there's an enormous amount of evidence to think that this might replicate in Sierra Leone. And let me try and explain why. If we think about the theory of change behind why we did the, why we did the immunization program in, in uh, India, it was the following. We think that parents want to vaccinate their children, right? because they are vaccinating at least once. So we're, our view is the parents want to vaccinate. We think they can access a clinic. Again, they're getting that first in immunization. It's tough, but they are managing to get through sometimes. So they can access the clinic. They need the provider attendance to be sufficient to be able to you know, get some vaccination. And that is why we did fix the supply in this case, because we did think it was a barrier. Then there are, um, uh, then we have to actually run the program. That's part of the theory of change, right? There have to be incentives and the incentives have to get to the parents. And then there's a kind of behavioral component, which is that we think the parents procrastinate. Um, that one of the reasons people don't invest in preventative healthcare is because they want to do it, but they just don't get around to it. And we think that there's, that small incentives can offset um, procrastination and, and, and biases. And that because they offset biases, then the immunization rates rise and we think that that improves health. So this is kind of the full theory of change uh, for this program. Now, what do I know in my new context about these different steps? Well, I've been working in Sierra Leone a long time. I've done a lot of descriptive work. Um, I know that access is hard. Uh, a lot of people live quite a far away from a clinic, and I know health worker absenteeism. But I also know that that first shot, 84% of people get that first shot, so it's not impossible to get immunized. And I also know some institutional context about Sierra Leone, which is that unlike India, where you have these small subcenters with one nurse, so that the subcenter is often closed, because of absenteeism. In Sierra Leone, it's not like that. You have these bigger centers with like six people. And so often one person is away, but it's very unlikely that the subcenter is closed. Um, and it's virtually, and it, particularly on immunization days, they always have an immunization day and clinics are usually open on that day. So I think actually access may be easier in Sierra Leone than it was in India because of these institutional things. So I need to know that knowledge. And this is just kind of a bit of a, extreme example, but if I was thinking about what is the local institutional um, information I would want to know about whether this project might replicate, this is going to tell me a lot. This is the immunization schedule for two made up countries, but they're kind of roughly Sierra Leone and northern Nigeria or Nigeria, right? Um, country two is a bit of an extreme version of Nigeria, right? So. Um, one is it's high at the beginning, but it falls a lot. And if you look at immunization rates in different countries, they kind of fall into these two patterns. One is high at the beginning, declines, and the other is low and stays low. And so I don't think that, for, you know, that country too is really the context for this program because this program is designed for helping people get over this tail off, right? So this is actually, this is almost a sufficient statistic to understand what kind of context might be relevant. Then, but then I have to think about that next step in the theory of change, which was, can I implement the program? Um, and we know that NGOs delivering and implementing is very different from governments implementing. So that's gonna be a huge question. And unfortunately, I won't get into this so much because we don't have a huge amount of time, but. RCTs on implementation are actually, we do many fewer. So in that review of 70 plus RCTs on health, only six were about health, you know, sort of changing the 
the institutions of delivery, like changing the way nurses are paid um, and incentives within the system, most of them were about getting consumer demand up and consumer behaviour. And we actually know less about this area. Um, but we can, but we can know through other methods about, you know, we can think we have to think about delivery in our new context. So let's just go back to the theory of change. So we've looked at Sierra Leone and said that we think that actually provider presence is sufficient and those things hold. So that's not an RCT though. I'm get, not getting that information from an RCT. I'm getting that from descriptive statistics and institutional knowledge. And then I've got to work out, can I deliver the incentive? And we're actually doing this now in Sierra Leone. And we're, the way we're going to find that out is actually also not an RCT. That's just, we're going to try and do it. And then we're going to measure whether the incentive actually gets to the parents. Not then does it have impact, but does it, like, are they physically capable of getting an incentive into the hands of parents or will it all get stolen? And then we've got question, the next step in the theory of change was about behaviour and um, and this sort of underlying general questions about do, do parents procrastinate and does procrastination, can it be offset by small incentives? And we've got a ton of evidence on that. We've only got one RCT on immunization incentives, but there's tons of evidence on that. And I won't go through it all, but there's good theory. Lots of people have tested this, not on immunization, but on HIV or you know, many other different uh, different aspects. We also have a lot of evidence on small price changes, having deterring, you know, increase in prices, deterring take up. That's all driven by the same theory that we procrastinate and we don't invest in preventative health. So it's, these are very different studies, but they all support the underlying theory here. Uh, and indeed, there are lots of studies on small incentives. There are lots of studies on big incentives and CCTs affect increased immunization. And in Malawi, we saw that, that small incentive had a just as big an effect as a big incentive. It wasn't on immunization, but it's still talking about behavior change. And as I say, um, HIV testing and some of our work in, in Bangladesh too. So looking again at this theory of change, there's only one RCT that goes from beginning to end exactly the same. But I've got, you know, I'm using descriptive data to do the first. I'm doing logistical pilots for the next bits. I have a ton of RCT evidence on the next two and lots of medical studies that show that if immunization go, happens, then health improves. So underlying this whole idea of using this theory of change approach to see whether something would generalize is the idea that that middle chunk, the sort of the behavioral stuff of do we pro procrastinate about health is a general lesson and that those general lessons generalize better. Um, and this I think is a good example. This is, as I was talking about, changes in price for preventative goods. Lots of different preventative health goods lots of different countries, very similar effects. And these are really testing this idea that people um, won't pay much of a cost to invest in preventative health. And we see that you know, in non-communicable diseases in rich countries, um, making that investment now for a health benefit a long way away, we are really bad at, you know, we eat the chocolate cake or the, or, um, or the chips. Um, no, it's all part of the same theory. So here you're seeing very small changes in price leads to a dramatic drop off um, in take up. And that's a kind of general idea. And you, you see very similar effects. So, so when we reviewed this literature on health, we see that these kind of general ideas underlying what's motivating consumers of health, really those are the things that we see a lot of, a lot of generalizability. And that's very different from saying a program generalizes. This is an underlying behavioral response uh, that generalizes. Um, let me just briefly do a little detour <laughs> about reviews because I know this is something very uh, dear to the heart of 3IE. And say, so if you're thinking, of, if you use this kind of framework to think about whether results generalize to a new context, or, you know, we shouldn't necessarily be doing reviews of programs, we should be trying to review 
where the underlying general concepts um, are, whether we find a lot of literature supporting a general underlying concept, rather than saying, how many studies are there on immunization incentives? We should be saying, what do the studies say on small in incentives for behavioral health? And it could be HIV, but you know, it could be all sorts of things that are the, that behavior. And I think, so I'm, my call is for what I would sort of call a more standard literature review approach, which is much more theoretically driven and is not, you know, we should be careful when we do our reviews not to do, uh, in the education space, there's been a lot of reviews recently that have done things like say, well, do computers help? Well, computers do all sorts of things and they, they're part of very different theories of change. Um, you know, the what you find is computers help in improving learning where they are part of a theory of change that is allowing the, the um, allowing the content to be adjusted to the level of the child, then they work very well. But when they're doing something else, they don't work very well, right? So I don't, when I'm doing a review, I don't want to put all the studies together that have a computer in them and look at the average effect of all the studies that have a computer in them. I want to say, let's look at all the studies where you deliver the, deliver the content at the appropriate level for the child. And there's one of those with computers, there's one with volunteers, there's one with splitting the class, there's you know many different pro studies. On the surface, they look all different, but un the underlying theory of change is actually the same. So when we do reviews, you know, a plea to do it like that. Um, this is this is an example of a study where um, that was very effective in Kenya, and the Rwandan government asked us to tr to bring the results to to Rwanda, and we had to think: Would it make sense in Rwanda? So let, let's go through the theory of change of this study. They w looked at. HIV rates by age in Kenya and they found that older men are much more likely to be infected than younger men with HIV and they found that girls in the local schools did not know that they knew how HIV was spread but they they didn't know that older men were more likely to be infected than younger men in fact if anything they probably thought the other way around because they thought younger men are more promiscuous and therefore they're more likely to be infected so the and yet, in that context, a lot of younger girl, a lot of girls were having relationships with older men because there was, because uh, there's, you know, a lot. It's not exactly transactional sex. It's but a lot of kind of sugar daddy relationships is what they call it. So, on, you know, if you go out with an older man, he's richer. He's more likely to buy you better presents. If you get pregnant, he's more likely to be able to look after you. Um, so, so that's the incentive for girls to go out with older men, but they didn't know the cost. So they provided information, this information, about how much more risky it was to, to have unprotected sex with an older man. And you find a dramatic reduction in pregnancies with older men as a result of this simple information campaign. So the theory of change, as I say there, is that the girls are trading off the costs and benefits of having sex with older men. So older men can give you more gifts and they can support you if you get pregnant but there's a risk of getting HIV. And if I don't know that older men are riskier, I'm gonna make the wrong decision there. Um, and providing that information allows people to adjust uh, though that cost and benefit. So when we take this to a new population, what are the things that we have to look at? Well, in Rwanda, there's a lower rate of HIV overall, a lot lower than Kenya. And we found that girls already knew that older men are more likely to have HIV than younger men. Right? So that part of the theory of change is starting to fall apart. But we also found that girls massively overestimated the rate of HIV in the population in general. So if we use our economic theory and we say we're gonna tell them the rates of HIV amongst younger and older men, they're not going to change the relative risk of older and younger men because they already know that. But they're going to realize that the risk of getting HIV is much lower than they thought. So a standard economic theory would say the result of that would be more pregnancies. Right? So 
we said probably not a good idea to take this. So I think what I want you to take away from this is when we talk about what's the relevant context, we've got to think about the theory. And then we've got to use local descriptive evidence to think about whether it's relevant. It's not about are they close geographically. Rwanda's quite close to Kenya. But the key, and you could ask all sorts of other things that would say that they were similar. But you want to ask whether they're similar on the specific things that drive the theory of change. And I think that's what I want people to take away. And the final example is these um, series of studies on targeting instruction, which I've kind of already mentioned in the education space. So a lot of studies with very different ways of implementing, but all have this underlying theory of change of that you need to target the instruction to the level of the child. So in particular, the work that has been done by Pratam is, is uh, well, actually, all, not only by the work with Pratam, all of these studies identified children's current level of learning. Um, and in, in the Pratam example, it's about um, they divide them in, in these levels. So, you know, nothing, you can't even recognize letters, you can recognize letters but can't identify words, and so on up there. Um, and then the idea is you regroup children by the level of learning. And, you, and then there are many different methodologies for teaching, for implementing teaching at the right level. You could use teachers and volunteers. And, um, and, and you, so the, then the trick is to think about, is, is the country, does it have this need of children not at the right level, very heterogeneous groups in the class? Um, and then you can think about which of these is the appropriate one for a given country. Do they have the lots of volunteers that they could they already have a volunteer program they could use? Um, or do they have, is it better to train teachers? Um, other key elements are, are ongoing monitoring. So as I say, there are many different implementation models. Um, and you have to think about which of these implementation models make sense uh, in a given country. So here's the theory of change. Children in a, are in school, but uh, literacy and numeracy are low. Key part of the theory of change is that there's a really heterogeneous level of learning in a classroom. Uh, and then we sort children by learning, and the children attend the classes. And this is where things failed, where this program failed. It was that teachers, either children didn't attend, or the teachers didn't teach the right program, um, and then we're pretty clear that if you do all those things, children will absorb the lesson. So I just want to conclude by saying that um, when we ask, does evidence from an RCT or an impact evaluation replicate to a new context, or does evidence in general from impact evaluations replicate to a new context? That's just too big a question. It doesn't make sense. It's like saying, is money good? Well, money is good sometimes and not other times, right? Like money for sex, probably not good. You know, money when somebody's starving, probably good, right? So we just, it's too big a question. So if we are facing this in a particular context, what we want to ask is, what's the theory of change behind the original impact evaluation? Do their local conditions hold for that theory to apply? How strong is the evidence for the underlying general behavioral change? And can we make the implementation process work in this new context? And that might need a logistics pilot. And we're using different bits of evidence to answer all of those different questions, right? It's not just RCTs, it's, it's, that's why we need some descriptive evidence, that's why we need to know local institutions. And I just wanna end by saying, we're, we're also faced, like if you go, think back to my original questions, uh, one of the options was just wait right that we don't have enough evidence just wait and i think whether we take that action depends a bit on who we are like if i'm the ministry of education i have to do something next year in the school so i can't wait right? i've got to do and i've got when i make you know when i do i've got to train teachers somehow so i've got to i've got to act now um, donors have a different time scale if i've got a certain amount of money i may want to wait until i know that there's a program that investing in it will make a difference. So I might be able to wait, but you say we've got to think about the different actors. 
The other thing is people mm. often try and divide things into saying we've got enough evidence to act or we don't have enough evidence so we should do an evaluation. But there's often a big time overlap where we have enough evidence to act but it would still be useful to do more evaluation, right? So there's a lot of overlap there. Um, so, you know, CCTs are a good example. There's lots of evidence that they work, but there's still very useful evaluations that go on to make them better, right? So we've got enough evidence to think they work, but we can still be working on them to, to make them better. Um, and finally, I think there's a, this is a question more for, for researchers is, do we, you know, where do we, like when we're talking about should we do more replications, we've also got to ask ourselves when should we do more to be even more confident that something works in a new context versus saying, well, there's a whole area where we don't know anything. Like we're starting to do work on crime and the amount of work, you know, rigorous impact evaluations on how to reduce crime is really limited. So to some extent, we may just have to go with the evidence that we have in some areas in order to invest in other areas. Thanks.